depends where you are. Um, we're very happy to have you here uh, on our, our third, I guess, uh, or fourth, third session of the of the community of practice from the GPEC. Um, today we will be hosting Dr. Silamanesh Siege, who is part of the GPEC. She is a mother of two, a consultant pediatrician, and assistant professor of pediatrics at Child Health and School of Medicine, College of Sci Health Science in Addis Ababa University, and current developmental pediatrics fellow at the University of Toronto. She is the founder and president of the Ethiopian residence community based NGO called Gojo. I don't know if that's the right way, Solmanish. Okay. Accommodation and temporary shelter for patients in need, which has accomplished tremendous change in the life of vulnerable, vulnerable patients with cancer, disabilities, and chronic illnesses who has no means for shelter, food, and transportation during their, their stay at the government hospitals of December 2014. Salamanish is passionate about working with children with disabilities. She is working to become the first developmental and behavioral pediatric specialist in Ethiopia. Um, she has established the first neurodevelopmental developmental and behavioral pediatrics clinic at Tikur Mbesa Specialized Hospital, working on children with disabilities as of May 2019 through the expert networks she created with developed countries. She brought the hidden discrimination of children with disabilities forward to the stakeholders to promote their functionality. She is a communication and promotion chair of the Eastern Africa Academies of Childhood Disabilities, a representative of the International Alliance uh, Academies of Childhood Disabilities, and executive member of uh, this committee, which is the Global Professional Educational Co uh, it's Committee from the IAACD. Um, so as you see, she is a wonderful woman with a true passion for, uh, for disability. Uh, so let's give her a virtual applause, please. Salamanesh, welcome. Thank you, Claudia. Um, I'll be sharing the my screen. That's good. You, you you all can see. Yes. Okay. Great. All right. Um, thank you, Claudia, for the generous introduction. Um, so so uh, in the community of practice, um sessions we have been uh, presenting to you what what has our seniors have done so far and how we have learned it from them um, and this time we thought it would be worth to share what a starting um, young physician um, is doing and just to show you the start of the path and get more uh, support from all of you um, respected uh, senior staff and more experienced um, international leaders. Um, so I'll be sharing with you childhood um, disability in low resources setting. Um, this is uh, more or less uncharted territory in the low resource setups. And I want to share some of the lessons from Ethiopia that I have learned throughout my path. Um, and in Ethiopia today is March 19, 2015. So if you ever want to feel younger, then travel to Ethiopia. We have a different calendar. So this would be the outline of my presentation. Um, so as you know, I just wanted to uh, point out that we are now transferring. We have, it has been long since we have transferred from the Millennium Development Goals to the Sustainable Development Goals, which focuses on child health and well-being rather than reducing the child mortality. But I would say this is more or less um, not as much changed in low resources setups, and we're still trying to improve um, the forest goal from the Millennium Development Goals, although the world has advanced well far in the Sustainable Development Goals. And this is a, a report uh, from 195 countries 
uh, which, which shows the global burden of disease study. Um, and in this report, it says that 52.9 million children younger than five years had developmental disabilities, and about 95% of these children, they lived in low-income and middle-income countries. Um, and there has been many commentaries about this global research, as it um, as we don't have much accurate data from from low resource setups. Um, it's very difficult to conclude that this research has put incognizant to the condition in low resource setups. And as you can see um, among the distribution list that they have used, uh, one of the most important childhood disability, which is cerebral palsy, has not been outlined separately in this distribution list. But just to show you the overview of developmental disabilities in um, Africa slash Ethiopia. So again, going back to this um, big global burden of disease study, as you can see from 1990 to 2016, almost all of the in almost all of the continents, the burden of developmental disabilities has decreased, while in sub-Saharan Africa it has been consistently increasing. And the risk to child development, again, tends to be more prevalent in low- and middle-income countries. And this is where Ethiopia is. As you can see, 60% or more of the risk of childhood de developmental disabilities are prevalent in Ethiopia as well. And these are several different reports on the prevalence of disability in Ethiopia. And as you can see, intellectual disability estimated to be 2.4%, uh, hearing loss 11%, and vision loss 12.5%. You will not find much studies involving children with cerebral palsy as well. Um, while we know there is a high burden of um, cerebral palsy in our country, which I will sh share with you later. But just looking at these numbers, it's so fascinating to see that it is very low like this. Um, and this will make it harder to believe seeing even the burden in our hospital. So we don't know if these figures are low due to low prevalence or low detection but it looks like more due to low detection. And this is another um, wide um, survey that in, involving more than 60,000 people in one of the demographic surveillance systems. Again, you can see the classification here is very traditional, and this is how the types of disability were outlined. And again, the overall prevalence that was reported was very low. So I, I became very interested um, seeing all this um, data in Ethiopia. And when you are trying to know about children with disability, there is no enough data. You cannot, ex you cannot have enough scientific background to explain the situation. Um, and I was interested with the <clears throat> way the care for children with disability was given in Ethiopia, and we see most of our children chained and shackled like this. This is in one of the autism centers when the children get admitted. This is how you see them most of the time, because there is a belief that these children are behaving the way they are because of supernatural uh, possessions. So families tend to shackle them like this to prevent them from harming themselves and others. So I'll share you some of the stories. This is one of the child they have been um, seeing in one of the centers in Ethiopia. It's a 15-year-old child. As you can see, he's always his hands are always shackled behind. And even in the center, there was no way to... Con to regulate him, so this child was mostly uh, presenting with self-injurious behavior, so this was how they were able to control him. And actually, the, the most interesting thing about this child is he, was, he is very used to this way of living. So if you 
if you just untie him, he will ask for you to tie him. He will bring the ropes and ask you for you to tie him. And this was how he can regulate himself down. And as you can see, our children with cerebral palsy at, at a very advanced age, um, they have poor head control and this is how they are usually cared for. So the mother carrying the child and um, there are no any accommodation services within um, the countries which are accessible to all people. Sorry, admitting a person. So this is one of the stories um, that were shared um, in, in the day in the life study in Ethiopia. So Beta, she wakes up at 6.30 each morning. She makes her bed and gets ready for church. She has a physical disability caused by contracting polio as a young child and finds it hard to use the toilet as it is so low to the ground. She doesn't complain about this to her caregivers who are members of her extended family as she doesn't think they can afford to build one that is accessible for her. You can imagine how hard this is. And another mother from Senegal shared, my husband abandoned me and then divorced me three months after our child was born with an innate disability. He was influenced by his family who told him that I had brought bad luck into the family, that I had changed their lineage and that I was so picate, which means cursed, a carrier of bad luck. And this is the same story that we see in Ethiopia. So coming to my ho my hospital, the Gorambasa Specialist Hospital, this is one of the biggest tertiary hospitals in the country. We have about 700 beds and we see around 500,000 um, people per year. And uh, in the pediatrics department, in the neurology clinic alone, we see 400 to 700 children every month, out of which 20 to 30 percent are children with cerebral palsy. So this is why I've always wondered why cerebral palsy is not reported in the national studies and surveys that are done in Ethiopia. And one of the reasons is because it's not known as an entity. And pediatrics in Dockering Clinic, <clears throat> we see about 250 children with Down syndrome each year. In the cardiac clinic, you'll find 60 to 90 children with Down syndrome each month. And in the high-risk infantile clinic, we see about 250 children per month. So you can see this is a high burden of high-risk children. And we don't have any developmental pediatrician in our setup even in the one of the major tertiary hospitals. So I'll show you what happens in our neurology clinic, what used to happen. So this is usually the physician asking how the child is. Mother is saying, he's the same, I am carrying him around, he can't move or talk. And the physician is asking, are you giving him the seizure medication? Mother is saying, the medication is not helping. I am getting old to carry him around, and my husband left me. Please give me some solution. And physician says, condition is related to a permanent brain damage. You may try it for a wheelchair. I'll increase the phenobarbital today and see you after one month. So this is, this is how the care usually goes on. The physician's more focused on treatable conditions and the mother leaves always sad carrying her child on her back. And this is how I felt working in that clinic. I could not leave all these thoughts behind me and I, it, it was a constant worry for myself and I'm sure that is how our, my colleagues as well felt all the time. So I started thinking of solutions. I wanted to be involved in the care of childhood disability but I didn't know how. And one of my, the neurologist who works in the neurology clinic shared with me the idea of developmental pediatrics. That was the first time I heard about developmental pediatrics when I was in my third year of training as a pediatric resident. Then one, 
whom we call um, the father of pediatrics and who have been representative of the International Alliance Academies of Childhood Disability before me, Professor Amaham, also shared with me this would be a good field for me to pursue. Then, uh, you know, Professor Hans Forsberg, one of our pioneers in the International Alliance Academies of Childhood Disability. And luckily, I became to, I, I got the chance to be mentored by him. And I started to copy his foot for footsteps and started to do the study that he did in Uganda, which was a population-based study on children with cerebral palsy. But I did it. I did a host, similar hospital-based study in Ethiopia using contemporary methods for the first time. As we know, there is no national data with regards to CP in Ethiopia, and the clinical features have not been investigated. So this was the first kind of study that we did in the Ethiopian setup in our hospital. And we studied the subtypes, motor function, and associated impairments of children with cerebral palsy. You'll find this manuscript in the BMC Pediatrics. And I'm working on the second one, which is on malnutrition in children with cerebral palsy. Well, with this study, I would say I decided not to have hair because that was too much work for me and it was taking too much time. So that's why I am like this now. Um, so I'll just share with you, um, being mindful of the time, the conclusions from the study. So we found out that children are being diagnosed with cerebral palsy, most of them being diagnosed after the age of five years. And they had severe functional impairments, so GMFCS and max level four and five. And our the predominant subtype, unlike what we see in the developed setup, it is bilateral spastic and dyskinetic cerebral palsy. And the most um, interesting thing that we found was these children they had adverse they were fine during the antenatal period, but they had adverse events during delivery and postpartum period. And as you can see, high rate of infection, high rate of trouble feeding, difficulty breathing, seizure, and connectors. So this showed the same pattern as has been reported from other African countries, a cause of cerebral palsy being uh, presumably the most preventable causes that have been aborted in the developed setup. And they had two or more associated impairments. So almost 100% of our children had speech difficulties and followed by intellectual difficulty, feeding difficulty, and seizure. And there was confusion where to refer the patients, and there was lack of awareness of how to manage CP in low resource setup areas. And we have found out there is great discrepancy in diagnosing cerebral palsy among clinicians. So as you can see, significant number of children were not diagnosed with CP while they had CP, and other significant number of children, they were previously diagnosed as CP, but we found out that it was not CP. So we have to change the subtype of 20 children, and most of the patients, they come only to refill the medications, as I shared with you, which was ordered for seizure and other associated impairments. Otherwise, there was no functional goal. There was no developmental coaching being given to these patients. So that is what has led me to establish the developmental clinic. I start, so as soon as I graduated in 2018, I started a separate developmental clinic, which runs once a week using um, the neurology clinic afternoon sessions because we were not able to get a separate room for ourselves. And we, we started to see 15 to 20 patients uh, in that one afternoon with five or six residents that were assigned to the neurology clinic. So that decreased the amount of patients that each person sees so that we can give more time to listening to what the functional goal of the, the child and the families are 
because usually we see about 80 patients per day in the neurology clinic. So we focused initially on proper evaluation, listening to the parents, doing full physical examination, and uh, using contemporary classification methods. And I started exploring available rehabilitation centers in the city uh, for early referral. And I would, I'm thankful to the international academies and the European Academies of Childhood Disability uh, for the opportunities that I have gotten to learn from my colleagues all over the world. So this is the famous the IC framework um, uh, by Professor Rosenbaum, and it has been a great um, leading instruction in our clinic. Um, trying to divert the thinking of the residents and the physicians from the fact that we always thought about body structure and function and we started to think more about the activity, participation and other personal factors for the child. And I would say what had helped me most in this progress um, of my work was being affiliated with international um, experts and international associations like the Equalism, International Developmental Pediatric Association, the Eastern African Academies, the European Academy, and the International Alliance. And so what, the way I did it was just reach out to these academies and I asked that I want to be involved in this work. Um, and they were very encouraging and supportive and I started learning from them. Um, and teaching my residents in arranging um, case discussions with other universities like the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. And these are some of the rehabilitation centers that I, identify, I identified within the city, which I had no idea they existed until I started this work. And to your surprise, even the government or the Ministry of Health they didn't have a list of these rehabilitation services. So it was very hard to find them. And it was through the word of mouth and some patients who are linked to the centers that we were able to identify the centers. So this is one of them. Autism centers, very um, popular one. And we have <clears throat> the Cheshire Ethiopia where children with cerebral palsy and other physical disabilities get rehabilitation services. And we have other centers uh, whereby children, they mostly focus on children with cerebral palsy, but we didn't know how to link with the services and finally figured out how to refer our patients to them. And currently we have a strong link with the services. But as you can imagine, um, it's very limited to the to the uh, main city, and most fam most of our families come from the countryside, so it would be hard to do a back and forth um, travel to the main city at the Sababa, and that's very expensive. And um, so that was how I uh, I started to engage my other organization in helping the patients commute as well. And so this was, I, we started to think how we can reach outside of Addis Ababa, the capital, and because they are, they, we have general practitioners and health officers pra practicing at the peripheries, and we know development is usually, usually ignored. And we were not sure when to, uh, m most of the physicians working in the peripheries, they are not sure when to refer to tertiary hospitals like ours. So we get delayed referrals, and most of the time the families have despaired already by the time they reach to us. And there are no developmental screening tools in Ethiopia. So I started to be engaged with the Ministry of Health and started to teach early childhood development um, trainings in some periphery um, centers. And we developed this very simple um, developmental assessment tool to be integrated into the international integrated management of time in CI, which the WHO um, recommends to be used in low resource setups. 
So we integrated this developmental milestone checkups into this guideline, which most health officers use in the periphery and it's on the way to be published. And we, these are some pictures of us showing uh, moving to some of the periphery sites of Ethiopia and giving developmental coaching to um, physicians and health officers and nurses working in the periphery sites. And finally, formalizing my dream. So I had um, a chance to be uh, accepted to the University of Toronto to do my fellowship in developmental pediatrics, which was my biggest dream. This is my son. Um, and so this, this, this is the Bloom article. You can go ahead and read it in in the Holland Blur uh, newsletter if you're interested. So I... We, we finally traveled here um, in 2021 after running the clinic for two years. And I realized we have so many assessment tools in Canada. Um, so I, I started thinking how best we can adopt this practice into the Ethiopian setup and low resource setups. And as you know, most of the tools, they use um, play techniques, which are routine in Canada, but will be very advanced for Ethiopian children and, um, and culturally very different. So among these tools, I became very interested in the early identification of cerebral palsy, which is the Hammersmith Neonatal and Infant Neurologic Examination Tool. So currently my fellowship project, I am focusing on adopting this tool into the Ethiopian setup. So far, I have um, trained for batches of residents, and we plan to do it to train six batches of residents, uh, and we have been able to integrate it into the teaching uh, schedule within the Kurambesta Specialist Hospital. So now residents and physicians are picking children at high risk of cerebral palsy, and with those children with a high probability of cerebral palsy as early as three months of age. <clears throat> So I'll just show you the preliminary result we have so far. So we know 40% of our children are under the curve of high probability of cerebral palsy. 26.7% require monitoring and developmental coaching and future follow-ups to determine whether they have high probability or they have optimal expected optimal scores. But 33% of our children um, within the clinics, and we are doing this within the high-risk clinic, neuro neurology clinic, and developmental clinic, they have optimal scores. And the greatest achievement, I would say, would be we are referring those children, these two groups of children, as early as three months of age to the community centers. So how how can... We progress this work further. As we know, there are, let's say that there are no enough risk factors to cause childhood disability. On top of that, currently we have so many war all over the world. And as you can see, Ethiopia is one of the major war affected area. And this would be, um, a major impact in childhood development, and it as you as you would know, this is a big topic that we can discuss some other time. But it has a very high toxic stress level that would cause high impact in child development and mental health. So we are saying learn the science and act early, but we cannot implement this without avoiding the risk factors. And I would say, speaking for my country. The world's deadliest war is also the least known, which is happening currently in Ethiopia. And these are the fatalities related to armed conflict, which are reported recently. I would correct the Ethiopian um, data because we have 600,000 plus uh, fatalities. And so you can imagine how many children are facing childhood disabilities from different causes because of such war. So I would ask that we would, we may need to um, change our 
navigation system and we may need to change our approach to helping these children who are impacted by war. And this is, we are seeing that from the northern region of Ethiopia from Tigray that we have high risk of malnutrition, preterm delivery, direct physical disability, developmental impacts of the toxic war stress and mental health impact. And you can see on top of the problem that we have how this would increase um, the number of children with disability. <clears throat> so now extending the work that I have been doing in the CT, we are we have been recently approached by one of the biggest tertiary hospitals um, in the northern region of Ethiopia, which is the Eider Hospital, affiliated with Magali University, to have the same developmental coaching teaching with their residents and also um, promote developmental coaching teaching to families and how to relieve this war stress um, among the children and hopefully bring um, bring them to the point where they can achieve their developmental milestones. So um, currently I am expanding my wing, I would say, and trying to involve uh, as many as uh, this war affected children in the northern region of Ethiopia and teach the physicians who are already been working under stress. But I would ask the international community to be able to share resources with these families and with these physicians. And I will be inviting you um, to do some of the developmental coaching teachings with me. So look for it. I will be sending invitations soon. So that my future plan is I would like to have a nationwide separate developmental pediatrics field train developmental pediatricians all over the country, establish an organized multidisciplinary team, and basically establish the format that I have learned here in Canada in the low resource setup areas. Thank you so much for your attention. These are my kids. Uh, very nice to see you all. I'll stop sharing so that we can have a discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Zilamanesh. That was just great. Um, a lot to think about. Um, how do you want to proceed uh, after this? Do you want to make some breakout rooms? Yeah, sure. We can Leave have a... space for questions. You tell me. Well, uh, I would ask Professor Peter, what do you think, Professor Peter? Should we have breakout rooms or we can have um, overall discussions here? There, there's a small enough, my, my judgment would be that there's a small enough group that people should turn on their cameras and um, just share ideas. We have about 20 minutes, so it would be nice to have the discussions here. I have a question to start. <laughs> sure. When you say you are adapting to the to the um, Ethiopian community, the high assessment tool, uh, what do you mean by by adapting it? You're changing the way you assess, or or, or what's what's mm -hmm. what you're what you're adapting? Yeah. Um... So with the, with the Hein, we are lucky enough um, that we don't have to make, to do much cultural adapt adaptations uh, to the Ethiopian setup as we practice in English in the medical field. And most of, as you know, the high end assessments are just neurological examination techniques that we have been practicing in uh, medical school, but we are just... It just formalizes and standardized and put a score into it. Um, so, uh, but with with some of them, like I, I would say, a very simple adaptation that we made was, um, uh, for example, use of any simple materials that you get in the clinic to do the assessments instead of like trying to find black and white colored tool to assess visual, or having that standardized. 
um, hearing assessment tool. We are just using like um, a container filled with salt, for example, just to assess the hearing of the child. Um, yeah. Just simple things that we are modifying, but um, the hind doesn't need too much change to be adapted into our setup. The other tools, for sure, I would say, would need much cultural adaptations. <clears throat> so it's mainly like the language that it comes in English and like, there is no translation, right? No, we didn't need any translation because the physician um, is, um, the physicians are currently practicing in English in the medical field. So we don't need any translation. We just need consent and explaining to the parents on how we are doing this. And we went through the IRB process for that. Uh, and the families, um, the feedbacks that we have been getting from the families and the physicians was very encouraging. They were very happy and they felt like the children are being seen, which is a different thing that has been happening previously because we usually take like five minutes to see the child, refill the medication and send them back home. But currently, like they are doing full assessment, scoring the child, discussing developmental coaching and early referrals, which is um, great to see and very encouraging. So I'm I'm planning to expand that to the other regions as well. Um, yeah. Thank you. Uh, I have a question. To Salamanesh. <laughs> Go ahead, Salamanesh. Yeah, um, first of all, it's a wonderful uh, presentation. Nice to know the trajectory. The, it's a, uh, a very impressive journey. Uh, my question is actually <coughs> sorry, you'll excuse me, I have a sore throat today. Uh, I hope I'm clear. Yeah. Yes. So, are you able to hear me well? Yes, we are. Okay. So you did mention that you keep referring children to community centers at this point of time. So I would like to know because uh, the situation in a big city like Delhi with um, you know hospitals, uh, large tertiary settings is very similar to what you've been doing. There is developmental pediatric clinic with a pediatric neurologist heading it. And of course they have a wonderful team there. All the diagnosis assessments, everything gets done. Uh, but actually what's happening is the referral to community centers has not been very significant here. Mm -hmm. And uh, in fact, uh, still the impression is that children will be referred from community centers to the hospitals for all the you know care and investigations that they need. But the long-term follow-up for home management or the guidance to the caregivers is yet to pick up in India. So I would like to know how you've been doing with the community centers that you've been referring children to. Yeah, that, that's a very important question, Sunanta. And I, I would say we're not doing a perfect job with that. Um, as, as you can imagine, we have like a high load of um, children that we need to refer to these community centers, very small community centers. And just to explain the difference from the setup I learned here in Canada, um, here it's um, like a government laid the community centers, but in Ethiopia, it's initiated by families, um, like a non governmental organization who are interested to help their own child and then started to expand into a non governmental organization. Um, and um, they have been training their staff with links with experts internationally. And we have, um, when I was back home, I was trying to help in some of the developmental coaching in these centers. Um, however, it's very hard with the long waiting line that we have to refer these children. So that's why currently we are trying to focus more on developmental coaching, especially for those children who are picked earlier. It would be easier to tell the parents what to do because the parents usually despair when they see um, especially physical disabilities in their children. Um, and it's very hard for them to understand that this is something that we can bring up into a functional goal. 
Um, so working on that aspect is something that I am trying to focus more on currently with the physicians from back home. Uh, yes, thank you for that. In fact, I'm also trying now to see if this engagement can be two-way because, of course, we have on one side uh, engaging community as a priority, but on the other side, the places we refer to, uh, we don't want it to end just as, you know, a diagnostic assessment or you know, giving a date three months later for the child to come. And we also realize that once the family goes to a big center, they're, they're actually a little reluctant to get back to the community center, um, at, at least a small percentage. Though there are few who take advantage of both. They know when to go, come to the center and when to go to the hospital. So it is still a dilemma now how we can actually establish a two-way relationship uh, for the long term that will help the family. So I thought your experiences would be very similar. And I really look forward to uh, you know, knowing from you more later when you uh, start uh, uh, interacting with all your community centers. Maybe you need to do it periodically. Yeah. All yeah. the best to you. Thank, Thank you, you so much, Dr. Linda. Peter, you wanted to say something, right? Well, <clears throat> there, there, there's so much to say. Uh, first of all, uh, a, an amazing level of dedication and being a champion um, for our field in a, a situation where there's so little understanding, of, first of all, of child development. And this, by the way, is true, sadly, in Canada as well. Things aren't quite as, as difficult. Um, but I wonder whether one of the ways that uh, one of the many things that could be done uh, is to try to find and get together the parents who are the champions in the way that you described. Um, and, and for them, first of all, to share their experiences and their ideas. And secondly, to recognize that while they are... Um, apparently alone in fact they're not alone um I mean, there there are many many things that that need to be done in any community including ours and i don't want to i don't want us to pretend that um that the so-called western or developed world is is has got all the answers because we don't but there may be some ways to bring together and support and encourage the development of a parent voice uh, for the region and for the country. Yeah, that is yes. I I would say that would be a very important um, way of encouraging like the whole community because um, it's a very social community. I would say speaking for my people and. Um, it would encourage them to see what the other parents do. Um, and sometimes yeah. in the clinics, uh, informally, when I was back home, I used to use that technique and show them that what the other families has achieved with um, being uh, involved in early intervention and developmental coaching. And they, that will cultivate much hope in the family. So that would be a great thing to consider and be able to do it formally um, in the future. Um, I, I know that the setup here is not also perfect, but I would say there is much support from the system here in Canada, um, yeah. which we lack in our setup. Um, although I have been affiliated with many of the higher officials and I mean with the influential uh, governmental systems in Ethiopia, uh, it was very hard to solicit re resources from this setup. So this would be something that we are unfortunately um, entitled to do alone. Um, but yeah. with the support of the international community, I'm sure we will be able to achieve it um, slowly. Or fast. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Yeah. Um, are you doing some strategies to visibilize 
I, I don't know if that's the correct word in English, but um, like disability, uh, to change the cultural way they see disability or around disability, because I think Mexico had that problem and it also, it, it's still going on, but I, I think the way people see disability or children disabilities, uh, it's more accepted since we have, uh, you, you may know Teleton. Mm -hmm. So it was a big event uh, with uh, touching stories. So people started uh, like seeing another way of looking at disabilities and and that uh, thought of, of that it's a curse or bad luck, um, I think it started to change. So, so I was wondering if there is like a, a communication strategy uh, on that onset to to manage this. Yeah, that's a great question, Claudia. And um, I would say in the CT because of um, like the early childhood development works we have been doing, which has currently continued with one of my colleagues as well. Um, she's running um some of the trainings I have been doing um within the city so many changes have come because they have been able to reach out to the community so in this trainings what we were doing was after teaching the physicians we go into the community and um, involve some of the parents um, and show them like some of the early playing techniques simple things um, and that that has i would say that has um changed most of the views in the city but in the countryside that would be um, something that we have to work hard on still because if you pass a very large country we have over 110 million people um, so it's it would take much effort and many collaborations to reach out to the whole country and as I said with the recent many um, challenge human made challenge with the war and everything the focus has now been changed into survival back again um so we are shifting backward in so much ways but we are trying to pick up this so that's why uh, i changed uh, not changed but i added the focus of um integrating the war affected zone which is the highly affected war affected region in the northern region trying to encourage the physicians and the community there that there is still hope even though uh, we have lost many people with the war and we have caused many disabilities i want to follow something that claudia has just said <clears throat> that that may be obvious but it's important to say and that is as you described earlier salamanesh the the beliefs and this is true around the world, that there are beliefs about what disability means. And those beliefs are cultural and religious and, and so on. And, and I make no judgment about that. But what's important, I think, is that if parents feel that way, they uh, are reflecting the culture of the community. And other people in the community are doctors, nurses, therapists, politicians, public figures, and so on. That is the way people in that community think. And so changing, tr trying to change that is, I think, fundamentally important and probably a big challenge. Uh, but what do you think are the attitudes toward disability among our colleagues? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's also another important thing. Um, so th I guess most of the despair in the physicians also come from the culture we we have been grown in, um, and most of the neglect I would say with, uh, despite like our seniors always trying to focus us into developmental uh, um, milestone study, for example, as a simple example, in the field of training. Mm -hmm. not, not many re residents read about it and not many residents give it any attention um i i, I would say like when we were doing our final exam like i can share from uh, my batch that i was more reading about developmental um, milestones and um 
there has been comments from some of my friends that they were telling me like don't spend too much time on this <laughs> like you have a lot of things to study for the exam um yeah. yeah so those are the things that we don't commit enough to pursue um but i i think as we show them the change that we can bring then i guess we can engage more the physicians but you're right professor the the attitude of the physicians is also a big influence in this. And that is e that is equally true, if not as intense, right here in Canada. Yes. <laughs> There's still, and presumably in Mexico and in India and in r the rest of the world, there is still a strong belief that you can't do anything about disability and why should you bother? We don't teach child development well. We don't teach about possibility in the face of impairment and so on and so on and so on. And I'm, I'm not trying to, to make a comparison that, that we're as badly off as you because we're clearly, there are places in the world where things are improving. But the, the, the issues that need to change include uh, a whole variety of, of education and enlightenment and informing people about possibility in the face of differences. Um, but it's not, it's, we haven't got it right here either. I would agree with that. Yeah. Maybe that's a great opportunity. So like for the group or the GPEG or whomever to analyze like the big uh, information sources, how they're managing disabilities and maybe change the way um, the redaction is done and make more awareness about there's that it's not uh, dumb, that it's not um, like, uh, that there is nothing to do. Maybe it would change their, the way we write about disability. Also the beliefs of people who search um, can change a, a little and make more awareness about the um, the success of many people with disabilities. So, like how I they are breaking ground around the world. Mm -hmm. I think that that touches the the heart of many people. On, on the conference, we had a, a child with um, oh a young a young uh, person with uh, with CP, and he's a GMFCS five um he speaks with uh i don't know how you say in english with the um alternative voice. communication yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah and he was telling us about the journey to t to uh to get his ident uh, mexican identification um and he is for the for the tributary um office because he's working and and it's it's a big challenge and i think he he changed the world the, the way we all thought because we think we are doing a lot around disability and and there are many things that we are still not thinking about so when we involve people living with disability i think they are the best uh source to to tell us what we should be telling people actually or working around it so um, i don't know just i think we have a a big opportunity there to make work and uh, and make um like a difference around the way people and even uh, professionals see disability actually yeah and it's not it's not doing <clears throat> excuse me it's not doing this or that it's doing this and that and the other and some more there but but thinking about the many ways in which we can try to um change people's understanding um yeah. they're not they're not bad people they're not stupid people they're they're people who are uninformed um so it's easy to be angry and i used to be very angry and now i'm less angry and more recognizing how we can try to inform and enlighten people yeah thank you very much it'd be nice to see the other people in the call as well <laughs> i know christina yeah. is own
Turn your cameras on, people. We, we can take a screenshot. <laughs> My yeah, that was really nice. <laughs> Too many shy people. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I'll take the screenshot with your names. Then. Okay. Thank you Ready? so much. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I already. Ah, so now that it's no, just turned on her camera, so it's like another shot. Okay. <laughs> so, Nanda, smile. <laughs> I think done. Thank you, Zulemanish. Well, um, does anybody has another question or wants to add something? Amanda was speaking, but she was muted. Um. Uh, no, I, actually, I was saying that you know somewhere I think, uh, with developmental pediatricians also, uh, while our focus is still on. Uh, disability assessments and uh, what follows. I, I think the child development focus is coming back uh, thanks to functional classification and a lot of work, that pioneering uh, work from Can Child and uh, the efforts, all these. I find that in India, at least suddenly in the last one or two years, there is a lot of awareness and um, people have started looking them as children first and disability as an additional attribute which they must attend to. Because earlier, in fact, maybe there were just a handful of us who would uh, look at whether the child got immunized or child had the nutrition advice uh, in the early years. All these were actually lost because parents were just running from one specialist to another, an orthopedician, a pediatric neurologist, a developmental pediatrician and things like that, that precious time was lost before, a, before you know, the caregivers or families realized that this child needs to go routinely to a well baby clinic as well. And um, so when you mentioned malnutrition, this was my experience also in the early years of my practice that most children would come uh, malnourished one of the reasons, of course, is obvious they had feeding problems. The other was a wrong impression that therapists had that if a child gets heavy, uh, it becomes difficult to manage. And th so they would be very happy if the child ate less. So the many of these, which I think need to get corrected in the first 2000 days it itself, I think there's somewhere the convergence with early child development. And thanks to WHO, UNICEF, Whatever may be the reason, though I suspect it's mostly that we've entered an SDG era where collaborations are working. Uh, I, I find that uh, the conversations are getting uh, back to looking at a child as a developing child and then dealing with the disability as well. Mm -hmm. I hope that will be so even in your country. Um, it should be with you know people like you now um, looking at developmental pediatrics in a big way. Yeah, definitely, Sunanda, I shared that. Wait. Thank you. Okay. Claudia, do you want to close up? Yeah, sure. Well, um, thank you, Zelemanesh, for such a wonderful topic, um, for giving us the opportunity to think around uh, all these and, and the work from... Uh, how we can and from where we are um, to break this uh, disparity uh, barriers. So um, thank you everyone for being here, for taking the time. Um, we'll say, uh, send you an email for the next, uh, with the time and date for the next meeting. And we hope to see you here. Um, thank you for everything. And thank you for being here and thank you for way, uh, working towards disability. Thank you so much all for attending today. Have a nice day.